All right. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So this is the fourth day of MediPath International um, Emergency Medicine Symposium. And you guys have registered for the incredible um, suturing workshop with the apprentice doctor. So today we have a jam-packed uh, event for you. So just let me introduce myself in case some of you don't know me. I'm Dr. Shelley. I'm one of the senior emergency medicine residents at Morristown Medical Center in New Jersey uh, in the U.S. Um, and I'm one of the, I'm actually the director of uh, resident education as well. Um, so before we get started, when I introduce um, the amazing uh, lecturer that we have uh, that will be teaching you guys suturing, I want you guys, if you have gotten your suture kit, can you turn on your camera and show us how excited you guys are and show us your suture kits? Let's see. You can keep yourselves muted. Hey. <laughs> there we I'll go. The I'll be the awesome. first one. <laughs> that is freaking cool. <laughs> mm, lovely. Good to see. How, how excited are you guys? Oh my God. Oh, look, there's a whole little group. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that looks awesome. You guys are in for a, an awesome uh, adventure today. So keep those uh, cameras on because we'll, we'll be happy to uh, talk and see what you guys are doing with that suture kit, okay? All right, so let me introduce you guys to our lecturers. This is Dr. Anton Schieferts. He's a maxillofacial and oral surgeon. He's also the director of the Apprentice Doctor and the Future uh, Doctors Academy. So uh, let's welcome him to the stage. Uh, Dr. Anton, I will be sharing your PowerPoint just now. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Dr. Shelley and the Medipath team, um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I have to say that uh, this is, I've learned such a lot uh, since the beginning of the year, uh, um, you know, using Zoom to teach and to lecture. Uh, this will be my first suturing workshop and uh, uh, so, uh, you know, you definitely guinea pigs and uh, nonetheless, I believe it's, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, we are going to make the best of this and uh, I don't foresee any serious problems, but of course, uh, if, if you have any problems on your side, um, let's make it uh, as far as possible a two-way discussion. And uh, I like the chat room, um, Dr. Shelley, you'll keep an eye on the chat room, I hope. And uh, then, uh, you know, we will proceed. So let's just, uh, you know, give you, um, you know, I'm a practicing maxillofacial and oral surgeon as, as stated um, at retirement phase because uh, I've really uh, developed an interest in simulation training and uh, <clears throat> The apprentice doctor we've probably trained in the tens of thousands, if not in the hundreds of thousands of students how to suture. And, and this is a basic suturing workshop. You know, if you, uh, we, we uh, advance suturing, you know, that's just not enough time to, to add to the program. So um, I think let's then uh, kick off. Um, and uh, so basic surgical knot tying and suturing skills workshop. So you will see we are going to cover the following and uh, that's going to be just a bit of preparation. Um, basic surgery, when I talk about preparation, you know, you do have a simulation suturing uh, um, pad like this. And uh, uh, you also should have uh, a ruler and two plastic bottle caps, and uh, then you have to add to that some sticky tape. I hope you receive the message because we are going to make a little bridge to do the knot tying part of the course. And uh, the knot tying is not exclusively uh, used in suturing. We use it to tie off blood vessels, etc., etc. cetera. So uh, it, it's really a, a great skill to have. And um, we will focus in on that but specifically so on the one hand, the square knot tie technique um, and then the instrument tie technique. 
that will come in due course. <clears throat> Basically, surgical knot tying. Um, you know, some people um, are of the opinion that you can virtually just tie any knot. Uh, let me tell you, it's not exactly true. Um, you get certain uh, suturing materials that's actually very forgiving as far as the knot tying is concerned, but you do get especially your monofilament uh, sutures. Uh, they, they tend to unravel and you have to do to, to tie properly. Um, so it's very important. And uh, I've, uh, by way of observation, I've uh, uh, had a look at some of my colleagues and practicing medical professionals. And I've noted that some people are just like erratic. They, they, they do not do the knot tying properly. And uh, you know, that's uh, just so much of your success in suturing. Basic suturing techniques, are, uh, we will do a couple like your uh, interrupted suture. The, uh, I think you really should know how to do a mattress suture and to continue a suture. Uh, but in the course material, you will find around about um, eight or 10 suturing uh, techniques. Let me just get my phone as my timer here. And uh, then complications, very important. Uh, you need to understand complications. Number one, how to deal with those, recognize, deal with those. And of course, how to prevent it. You know, most complications are very much preventable and then we'll talk about the evaluation or the assessment module which you can do in due course and uh, there's a certificate uh, available if you actually complete the assessment module. Um, here we go, objectives of the course uh, is to equip students with a basic understanding of the theory of suturing wound and wound care and to acquire the skills to confidently tie surgical knots and suture lacerations. <clears throat> the students should on completion of this course have a good understanding of the basic principles of wound care, knot tying, surgical instruments used in suturing, suture material, various suturing techniques used by medical professionals. And you should have the following skills, how to tie a square knot, how to tie a surgeon's knot, placing subcutaneous sutures, interrupted sutures, placing a variety of mattress sutures, using a number of other types of suturing techniques, correcting minor discrepancies. Um, we will do all the basics, so please understand we cannot absolutely go through the full course. The full course uh, should keep you busy about 20 hours, and we have two, two hours. I've taught students how to suture in two hours, so here we go. This is this one is interactive. Okay, so I need you to give me um, Shelley. Do not move on this one. Just hold it on this photograph. Uh, so you are the physician. Um, <clears throat> you've got seventy-five <clears throat> students that can answer. So you are the physician in the ER, emergency room, and a patient with a seven centimeter laceration of the right hand is presented to you. So walk in and what are you going to do? Take me through, uh, let's uh, say, what's the first thing you're going to do? Let's not make it complicated. What's the first thing you're going to do? So um, shall we have a look in the uh, chat room? I just please. Yep. Um, all right, guys, the chat room is open. What would you do first? Okay. Stop the bleeding. Compression. I like that. Compression. That's all. You yeah, know, that's stop the bleeding. That's perfect. Good. Stop the bleeding. <clears throat> okay, some more, some more. Look, Look at, at the, the wound, wound assess assess the situation, the situation first. Uh -huh. Clean. Okay. Disinfect. Assess situation. Stop bleeding. Clean wound suture. <laughs> Hands. Hands above head. Oh, yeah. Put the hands above head to slow the bleeding. I like it. There's a lot of uh, 
uh, truth in, in some of these. Um, I want to focus in on disinfect and clean a bit. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and yes, okay, so uh, there, there's some somebody else remove solid object if there's some stop, okay. Remove solid object. Ali, you have to help me here exactly. I think uh, foreign bodies, if there's any foreign bodies in the wound. If foreign bodies in the wound. Uh, okay, may I just uh, comment on that? Let's just say it's a knife. Are you going to take the knife out? And the short answer is no. Okay, okay, so f foreign object. Okay, remove foreign object. Okay, 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 I get it. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so um, let's move to the next slide and I'm going to try to answer it. I'm going to give a bit of critical comments. Uh, so here we go. Um, now, of course, I'm going to qualify this for a moment. Um, uh, the first one is really assessment. So it takes you really 10 seconds to assess. Is there an indication for resuscitation. So a guy has got a stab, chest, you're not going to start suturing or cleaning or do anything else. You're going to assess to see if it's necessary to put the chest drain or, um, but let's just say it's a cut in the arm. Very, very, uh, I, I like the stop the bleed one because, you know, you want to stop the bleed first, you know. So, um, my my revised slide is actually just the other other way around. Okay, so stop the bleed, um, and that is pressure. If it's a venous bleed, you can lift the hand or the arm above the rest of the body. That's a good one. I like that. Um, but of course, an arterial bleed is not going to have any effect. So definitely, uh, I would say stop the bleed slash resus if, if it's necessary. Um, and then number two, number two, so just swap the first two on the, on the slide. Number two is medical history. Uh, uh, now that goes with assessment, of course, uh, that is part of your assessment, but uh, this is specifically directed. Uh, so you need to have the following information. Um, and the following information would be things like, I would say allergies, isn't it? Um, does the patient actually take uh, anticoagulant, uh, anticoagulants? Um, that's important when you do uh, any surgical procedure. So you keep in mind that, uh, uh, you know, it's not just like suturing. I get many adventurers and uh, fishermen that they just want to learn how to suture for in case it's a surgical procedure and you know although I do sometimes uh, uh, allow them to learn how to suture it's it's really um, not ideal because they do not understand the basic principles of surgery okay so medical history and uh, you know things like uh, medication they take and and so forth and so forth okay so what is the problem uh, uh, with um, let's just say somebody said disinfecting. So uh, my question is, what are you going to use? And you're probably going to use whatever is nearby or available. And uh, let's just say the um, your um, there's an iodine in your uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the disinfected preparation uh, is available, um, and your patient is excessively allergic to iodine, then you've, you know, it could be an anaphylactic reaction. You can actually kill your patient just right there. So, uh, so, so thus the medical history. And, you know, we're not talking about a comprehensive medical history. You're not going to sit and, you know, lean backwards and, you know, a two pager or, a, you know, like we've, not sure if the term used, but we say like clocking the patient, you know, when the patient gets admitted and no, no, not that one. It's like directed specifically, you know, and, and never ever, not even once in your life, uh, forget to ask the patient about 
allergies. Okay, it's just so simple, but it's going to keep you out of trouble and uh, on, on so many occasions. Okay, so cleaning. Okay, what cleaning? Cleaning the wound, taking the foreign objects out, um, or you're talking about cleaning as far as the uh, practitioner is concerned. And uh, of course, both, you know, you're first going to appropriately aseptically prepare yourself. And, uh, you know, if it's sort of like a, a one, uh, two centimeter laceration, you know, are you going to scrub and gown? And uh, probably not, you know. Uh, now you've got a patient with a, um, a 12 inch or a 30 centimeter laceration uh, on the leg. Uh, yeah, you're probably going to uh, up your level of uh, aseptic preparation in, in, uh, before you start your, your suturing. Um, okay, so let me just think about somebody else. <coughs> Disinfectant, cleaning and so forth. Okay, so just remember the, uh, just swap the two around, stop the bleed first, you know, that's sort of like the obvious one. But medical history, very, very important. And you have to also know your patient could be allergic to your anesthetic agent or your local anesthetic. So it's anesthetic considerations. Are you going to do it under local anesthetic? Are you going to do it under general anesthetic? And it, uh, you, you will be um, guided or directed by the age of the patient, the, the level of apprehension of the patient. Um, and probably to some extent to the uh, financial considerations, you know, if it's a patient uh, not on a healthcare plan and uh, you, you, uh, you know, hospitals are expensive and you add to that the hospital account, an ethnotist account. So, uh, so, so that will play a role. And uh, so anesthetic considerations, aseptic technique, the operator, that is you preparing the uh, yourself uh, aseptically um, proper or appropriate sterility technique, and uh, then the the wound. Now, if you see that this little brush here on the left bottom uh, of the picture is, if you've got an abrasion, your patient fell, and there's a lot of swell or um, uh, or dirt into the wound. There's just one way to get it out. And that is you are going to take a light soapy solution. You're going to take your brush and you are going to scrub this wound. Now, if you, um, I've done that plenty of times. If it's a, if it's a child and uh, you start scrubbing it, it starts bleeding profusely. And that's part of, I think Ali said, uh, that uh, re removing foreign objects. Yes, of course, you know, remove the foreign objects. It's often uh, glass or uh, it's just, it's just dirt, you know, so remove that. Uh, you, you, the, if you do not remove the dirt, it's going to go septic. The dirt will want to come out and your sutures are not going to keep it in sight and neither should it. So um, there we go. So you're going to scrub it and you're going to look gross and you know even the uh, scrub nurse is going to sort of frown on this but you are going to scrub and it's going to bleed profusely and it's going to really look uh, you know like uh, are you sure you're doing the right thing yes I'm sure and my wound that I scrubbed the two or three days later is going to look beautiful Whereas my colleague's wound, who was sort of like, um, maybe I shouldn't brush too hard, uh, his wound is going to have a slight yellowish cover. And unfortunately, his or her wound is going to go septic, and my wound is going to look perfectly nice. And then, of course, this is uh, common to surgery, and that is good lighting. You have to see what you do. You have to absolutely see what you do. Do not perform surgery um, if you haven't got good lighting like a, a top over there. It's just as simple as over the years, they've trained 
blind physicians, it can be done. They usually go with a, a helper that helps them to, to, to see and to, you know, they've never ever up till to, the, to this very day uh, trained a blind surgeon. Cannot happen, it's not possible. Okay, next slide. Uh, you, you saw that uh, antibiotics and medication. You are going to give painkillers. You are going to give, maybe, you know, don't overuse antibiotics. If it's, if, if it's a clean wound, a small wound, please don't, don't prescribe antibiotics. But if you should, you still need to know the uh, allergy pro profile of, uh, and the rest of the medical history. Okay, we are going to have a look at this quickly. It's just a case study. Dr. Shipton and his family are in their vacation apartment with a fantastic view of the exciting and treacherous Indian Ocean on the east coast of Africa for their annual two-week family vacation. The first week is awesome, the weather is good, and the sea is perfect for swimming. Let's get up early tomorrow and go see the fishermen reeling in their catches, Jamie, the elder Shipton's son, suggests, and the family agrees. It is July and one of the most spectacular natural events on Earth is about to occur, the sardine run. Schools of millions of sardines migrate up the coast, followed by game fish like barracuda, sharks, and dolphin, and nature lovers dream. Conditions for fishing have also been forecast as optimal, and hundreds of fishermen line the coast. Dr. Shipton and his family haven't caught on to the fishing thing, but this spectacle makes for great entertainment merely by watching from the sidelines. It's 8 a.m. and the Shipton family is ready for their walk down to the beach. As they pass a neighbor's apartment, they are suddenly stopped dead in their tracks by the sound of someone screaming, followed by an urgent shout, Help! Somebody, please help! A door crashes open with an even more urgent shout for help. Dr. Shipton runs to the apartment and discovers a 17-year-old boy virtually covered in blood. He's fallen and shattered the glass top on the coffee table with his head. Quick, bring me towels, he shouts. He tightly drapes a big towel over the enormous cut in the boy's scalp and applies firm hand pressure for a few minutes. The towel slowly becomes wet and saturated with bright red blood. The pressure is helping, but Dr. Shipton can clearly see it won't stop the bleeding. Go get my first aid kit. Mrs. Shipton races to their apartment and returns with a kit. Dr. Shipton always carries some local anesthetic, packets of suture material, and the relevant instruments in his first aid kit. He quickly injects local anesthetic containing adrenaline and almost immediately starts to stitch up the long 10-inch laceration in the boy's scalp. With each stitch, the bleeding slows and Dr. Shipton doesn't bother cutting the stitches. This is one long, continuous suture. Time is of the essence here and he has just one thing in mind, to stop the bleeding as soon as possible. The good doctor takes fairly large bites and makes the stitches tight by interlocking them. Then he uses another towel to clean up the wound, inspects the area for residual bleeding, and cleans up. Dr. Shipton then writes a note to the medical officer at the local hospital, giving him the relevant information and requesting him to take over the case, just in time for the arriving ambulance and the paramedics who rush in to assist with further stabilizing the team before transporting him to the local hospital. Okay, so um, you've probably opened your suture kit uh, already. So if you haven't done that, then please open your suture kit. You will see you've got uh, the basic, all the basic stuff for suturing, um, tooth forceps, the uh, Mayo Hagar um, needle holder, scissors, blunt sharp scissors, uh, um, the, the, the ruler, the marking pen, at the bottom, your uh, suture simulation pad. You, you will see the first one we're actually going to use are the, uh, <clears throat> the, the white and red uh, shoelace. So that one, if you can keep that to one side and the two bottle caps and the ruler, if you can keep that to, to one side. <clears throat> and of course, all the suturing material and so forth. Okay, next. 
So just a quick uh, overview, um, you know, scissors, uh, sharp, 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 blunt, that refers to the tip and the blunt, blunt. Um, and you also get suture cutting scissors and dissecting scissors. Now, normally, if you really want trouble in the OR, then you use your dissecting scissors to cut sutures, your scrub nurse is not going to be happy with you because those are expensive and they're very delicate. Okay, that's just a quick about scissors. Um, and then uh, the forceps, you will see the top in the page, that is an anatomical forceps or a flat forceps, a general purpose tweezer forceps. And the bottom one, you will see there's a, a we call it a rat tooth forceps. So on the one side, there's a little tip and the other side, a V-shaped a defect or a groove, and uh, this is the uh, toothed forceps or the tissue forceps, and that's just to prevent slipping. So you might say that little tip may injure the tissue. You know, if you use the wrong forceps and it slips all the time, you're going to cause a lot more damage rather than just using a very fine, like an Adson's uh, tooth forceps. Next. <clears throat> This is, of course, a needle holder. It's actually important to just uh, familiarize yourself with the uh, needle holder. So it's two handles or the two eyes, the rings as handles, and then uh, you get the two legs or the shafts or shank, and then the hinge and the beak or the jaws. Now the jaws on the inside, you will see they are, um, serrated. They, um, they specifically uh, made uh, crosshatch to do actually, uh, um, you know, I'm going to put it right there. At the, there at the. Okay, so that is to prevent slipping. Um, and then this little thing between the two legs, that is the ratchet or the lock. And you will notice it's got a, a three ratchet lock mechanism. And uh, we will get to that in a moment. This is, of course, the Mayu Hagar Eagle Holder. And this is the basic one. You know, you get more um, fancy needle holders, and I'll show it to you in a moment. Okay, so let's just get the, the hold right. So it, it's important. This illustration, so you really can't make a mistake. Thumb, you see the thumb, fourth finger, stabilize with your middle finger, index finger goes on one of the um, uh, legs or close to the, um, to the hinge, and then your little finger can just stabilize it. You see there? Okay, now you have to, you know, hold it like this. So you, you just look at it, and just see how the ratchet mechanism works. Okay, and then you take it in your hand and you lock the uh, ratchet. First or second, you rarely would lock it in the third locking mechanism. First is usually ample, but if you really want to tightly lock it, second. Okay, and you look at the, let me just put it there. Okay, so you look at the way it locks and unlocks. So you have to be able to lock, unlock. And unlocking is, is actually pushing it up a bit. So you have to first close it a bit more, push up and then open it. So lock, okay, lock, push a little bit further locking wise or towards, towards the close position, move up and open. So you'd be able to then lock quite easy. You know, that is something you can just, you know, there's really not a, it's really not a easy way, but to practice. And some people it's sort of like second nature. And for other people, it really comes in as a, um, as an effort. But nonetheless, <clears throat> that's the way it is. Uh, this is a tripod grip. So this is a typical tripod grip and, uh, <clears throat> You can see at the bottom right of the screen, uh, you can see the 
Matthew uh, needle holder. So here I've got one. And you know what? This one is really nice, the palm grip. And you close it and it will lock and you open, close it again and it will unlock. So close, there it locks. Close again. So it's just one direction. And it's palm grip. And what's nice is, can you, can you see my, my movement? Can you see? This is suturing. Okay. So you have to, even with your Mayo Hagar needle holder, this is suturing. Don't, it's not a linear movement. Don't, don't. If you do this, your needle is going to, your semi curved needle is going to become straight and you're going to start messing up. Okay. And as through Vega needle holder, this is a small one, micro tip, and you can see the same thing. You, and that is sort of like uh, a finger, finger hold, you know, like, and same thing. So um, we are going to keep it to the um, uh, Mayo Hagar needle holder. That's the one that you find it on any basic surgical set. And uh, the Matthew needle holder, it's one of my favorites. And you get one that's got a little scissors here as well, especially if you work at nighttime and you need somebody which is going to be yourself to do the suturing and the cutting of the sutures. That's a lo lovely one to have. Okay, let's move on. Okay. Dr. Mize is in a wonderful mood. This is Friday afternoon, and he's booked a short operating list because he's planned a special weekend away just for him and his wife. This is the last case, a routine laparoscopic removal of a diseased gallbladder. He has done so many over the years and has become quite an expert. I'm sure I will be able to remove this gallbladder with my hands tied behind my back, he jokingly remarks. First, second, and third incisions, instrumentation in place, and now for the careful dissection. 30 minutes and I'm out of here, he remarks. The inflammation has caused a lot of scar tissue, and the anatomy is not as clear as he expected. Suddenly, a surge of bright red blood. Suction, suction, he shouts. But it is obvious that the bleeding is much too fast for the suction to handle. Vision becomes impossible, and now is the time for quick, life and death decisions. Let's open up, he shouts to the assistant. Scalpel, diathermy, abdominal swabs, artery forceps. Dr. Byes knows that he needs to abort the laparoscopic camera procedure via the small buttonhole incisions. He will have to make a larger incision to access the bleeder and stop the bleeding. If the patient loses more than a certain amount of blood, she will go into surgical shock and may die. Finally, the bleeder is identified and everybody breathes a sigh of relief. Tie suture, Dr. Byes continues, amazingly relaxed now. Remove artery. He ties off the bleeder with an amazing amount of finesse and ease. Would you like to know how to tie a surgeon's knot? Okay, so that is uh, commonly used for um, tying off bleeders or, um, yes, tying off bleeders during surgery. Um, and uh, let's move to the next. Uh, so, you, you know, let's just get the two basic knots. And the one is if you tie uh, the knot twice uh, in, in the same direction. So your first throw, that's uh, the first knot or the part or the sub part of the knot, that's called the granny knot. It's called the granny knot simply because your granny taught you how to do that one. And uh, this is uh, on, the, on, on the right hand side. On the right hand side, you will see. Uh, sorry, there's a bit of an echo on some of somebody's. Uh, not, Okay, let's move back. There we go. Uh, on the right hand side, that is a square knot. And that is the one that you should actually use during um, 
during during not time. Sorry, let me just close this one again. Okay, so on the left hand side, granny knot, on the right hand side, square knot. Next page. Now you have to do this one, okay? So I've, I've uh, it's, it's really as simple as you use your two bottle caps, place the ruler on top, get your string, and then with sticky tape over the bottle caps, you tie it to your work surface. Okay, so you, you need a good work surface like a table or a, wherever you're going to do your suturing. So uh, if you can get that ready, uh, th these are the things that you need, two plastic bottle caps, ruler, sticky tape, uh, and the white and red string. Okay, so if anybody needs more time, just let us know. Otherwise, we will just slowly but surely go to the next page. And maybe let's just give 30 seconds. Uh, I'll be available in the chat room if you want to ask questions so far. Now I may just say, say um, the suture kits arrived on the nick of time, uh, thanks to you know the customs officers. You know I suppose they're just doing their work, but nonetheless, you know to keep uh, something like uh, urgent stuff uh, for a week or ten days at customs. That's really nerve wracking. Okay, do you have your ruler uh, constructed like a little bridgey? If that's right, then we can start with our first uh, knot tying. Uh, the, before we do the video, please, you know, slip the string out. Well, it's going to give you instructions, but try and follow it as closely as possible. And then uh, we will assess, you know, the uh, knots at the end of the video. So this is a very basic one. Make a square knot, one and tie. Okay, let's have a look and follow, follow the instructor as we go, as we move. Slip the string underneath the cardboard tube with a colored end to the near side and the white end to the far side. Hold the colored end in your right hand between your index finger and thumb and the white section in your left hand between your middle finger and thumb. Let the white section cross over the palm side of the open third to fifth fingers of the left hand with a white tip hanging down past the little finger. Place the index finger of your left hand under the white section and extend the index finger, draping the string over the tip of the index finger. Take the colored section to the far side, crossing over the index finger of the left hand and over the white section of string, forming an X. Bend the index finger to the left hand around the colored strand and rotate it under the white strand held by the middle finger and thumb. Straighten the index finger, making sure that the white section of string stays on the nail side of this finger. Rotate the hand, pulling the white section of string through the loop. Pull the white section towards you with your left hand and the colored end away from you with your right hand and tighten the first throw of the knot. Hold the white end in your left hand between the tips of your index finger and thumb and the colored section in your right hand between your index finger and thumb. Allow the white section to cross over the palm side of the open third to fifth fingers of the left hand. Bring the colored section from the far side to the near side, looping it over the third to fifth fingers of the left hand and over the white section of string to form an X shape. Bend the middle finger of the left hand and hook it around the colored section 
and beneath the white section of string. Straighten the index finger again while pulling the white end through the loop in a rotating motion. Take it now between the tip of the index finger and thumb. Pull the colored end towards you with your right hand and the white section away from you with your left hand and tighten the second throw of the knot. Okay guys, the knot should look like this. If your knot look like this, you've succeeded. Um, my experience uh, in the, so, so I wonder if we can, uh, shall we say either by show of uh, hand or in the chat room, I'm sure you want to do it another time. With uh, my physical workshops, it's usually by the second or the third time you get this. So maybe, uh, Shelly, shall we just do it another time? Okay, untie, 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 start all over again. Slip the string under Beneath the cardboard tube with a colored end to the near side and the white end to the far side. Hold the colored end in your right hand between your index finger and thumb and the white section in your left hand between your middle finger and thumb. Let the white section cross over the palm side of the open third to fifth fingers of the left hand with a white tip hanging down past the little finger. Place the index finger of your left hand under the white section and extend the index finger, draping the string over the tip of the index finger. Take the colored section to the far side, crossing over the index finger of the left hand and over the white section of string, forming an X. Bend the index finger to the left hand around the colored strand and rotate it under the white strand held by the middle finger and thumb. Straighten the index finger, making sure that the white section of string stays on the nail side of this finger. Rotate the hand, pulling the white section of string through the loop. Pull the white section towards you with your left hand and the colored end away from you with your right hand and tighten the first throw of the knot. Hold the white end in your left hand between the tips of your index finger and thumb and the colored section in your right hand between your index finger and thumb. Allow the white section to cross over the palm side of the open third to fifth fingers of the left hand. Bring the colored section from the far side to the near side, looping it over the third to fifth fingers of the left hand and over the white section of string to form an X shape. Bend the middle finger of the left hand and hook it around the colored section and beneath the white section of string. Straighten the index finger again while pulling the white end through the loop in a rotating motion. Take it now between the tip of the index finger and thumb. Pull the colored end towards you with your right hand and the white section away from you with your left hand and tighten the second throw of the knot. Okay, there's the knot. Should look like this. Um, okay, let's uh, give it another uh, just a chat room. Anybody needs to do it again? Just say yes, no. We'll go by, you know, five or six people. Do you need another chance? One more time? Yes. Okay, we'll do it the last time. Okay, just understand as you bring the, 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 the string through the loop, you, you're holding with the other hand, you have to release it if you bring it through the loop. I hope that helps somebody, especially on the first throw. Okay, third time lucky, let's do it. Slip the string underneath the cardboard tube with a colored end to the near side and the white end to the far side. 
Hold the colored end in your right hand between your index finger and thumb and the white section in your left hand between your middle finger and thumb. Let the white section cross over the palm side of the open third to fifth fingers of the left hand, with a white tip hanging down past the little finger. Place the index finger of your left hand under the white section, and extend the index finger, draping the string over the tip of the index finger. Take the colored section to the far side, crossing over the index finger of the left hand and over the white section of string, forming an X. Bend the index finger to the left hand around the colored strand and rotate it under the white strand held by the middle finger and thumb. Straighten the index finger, making sure that the white section of string stays on the nail side of this finger. Rotate the hand, pulling the white section of string through the loop. Pull the white section towards you with your left hand and the colored end away from you with your right hand and tighten the first throw of the knot. Hold the white end in your left hand between the tips of your index finger and thumb and the colored section in your right hand between your index finger and thumb. Allow the white section to cross over the palm side of the open third to fifth fingers of the left hand. Bring the colored section from the far side to the near side, looping it over the third to fifth fingers of the left hand, and over the white section of string to form an X shape. Bend the middle finger of the left hand and hook it around the colored section and beneath the white section of string. Straighten the index finger again while pulling the white end through the loop in a rotating motion. Take it now between the tip of the index finger and thumb. Pull the colored end towards you with your right hand and the white section away from you with your left hand and tighten the second throw of the knot. I've just uh, messed a bit with the zoom and I'm, I'm, I'm fixed it. So, um, okay, so we are not going to do it again. This is it. Okay, if you still need practice, you can practice at home uh, or wherever you want to practice after the workshop. Let's move to the next one. The next one is going to be the um, instrument tie okay just uh, i'll keep it on hold for a moment so you are going to use your you are going to use your may you have your needle holder and uh, you are going to use your string untie it, untie it completely. And uh, yes, just follow the instructions of the video. So let's do it. This one is important. Okay, with this one, the previous one, you didn't uh, tie a proper knot, you can still practice at home. The next one, you have to be able to do this. So please pay attention. It's actually easier. Slip the string underneath the cardboard tube with a colored end to the near side and the white end to the far side. Hold the needle holder in your right hand and position it parallel to the cardboard tube with the tip pointing to the left hand side. The latch mechanism of the needle holder must be unengaged at the stage. Hold the colored section on the near side between the thumb and index finger of the left hand. To make the first loop of a square knot, bring the colored section of the string from the near side over the needle holder, down and back to the near side. To make a surgeon's knot, wrap the string around the needle holder a second time. Open the jaws of the needle holder and grasp the white section on the far side, close to the tip of the string. 
Engage the ratchet latch mechanism. Listen for the first or second click. Pull the white section towards you using the needle holder and the colored section away from you using your left hand. Tighten the knot, thus completing the first throw. Unclip the latch of the needle holder and release the white tip. Place the needle holder parallel to the cardboard tube with the tip pointing to the left hand side. Hold the colored section on the far side between the thumb and index finger of the left hand. The colored section of the string is brought from the far side over the needle holder, down and back to the far side, thus making the second loop. Open the jaws of the needle holder and grasp the white section, now on the near side, and close it at the tip of the string. Engage the ratchet latch mechanism. Listen for the first or second click. Pull the white section away from you using the needle holder and the colored section towards you using your left hand. Tighten the knot, thus completing the second throw. Unclip the latch lock of the needle holder and release the white tip. Okay, most of you should be fine with this one. Uh, Shelley, I think just to be uh, fair, let's just do it a second time. And, um, you know, you will hear somewhere they say if you make a surgeon's knot, you know, go around a second time. Um, of course, if you do a square knot, don't, just don't do that, you know. If you've done a nice square knot, you can do a surgeon's knot and on the first throw you go twice round your needle holder. Okay. Yes, a lot easier, isn't it? But you have to master both. But for suturing, the instrument tie will be good. Okay, so do it again. Slip the string underneath the cardboard tube with a colored end to the near side and the white end to the far side. Hold the needle holder in your right hand and position it parallel to the cardboard tube with the tip pointing to the left hand side. The latch mechanism of the needle holder must be unengaged at the stage. Hold the colored section on the near side between the thumb and index finger of the left hand. To make the first loop of a square knot, Bring the colored section of the string from the near side, over the needle holder, down and back to the near side. To make a surgeon's knot, wrap the string around the needle holder a second time. Open the jaws of the needle holder and grasp the white section on the far side, close to the tip of the string. Engage the ratchet latch mechanism. Listen for the first or second click. Pull the white section towards you using the needle holder and the colored section away from you using your left hand. Tighten the knot, thus completing the first throw. Unclip the latch of the needle holder and release the white tip. Place the needle holder parallel to the cardboard tube with the tip pointing to the left hand side. Hold the colored section on the far side between the thumb and index finger of the left hand. The colored section of the string is brought from the far side, over the needle holder, down and back to the far side, thus making the second loop. Open the jaws of the needle holder and grasp the white section, now on the near side, and close it at the tip of the string. Engage the ratchet latch mechanism. Listen for the first or second click. Pull the white section away from you using the needle holder and the colored section towards you using your left hand. Tighten the knot, thus completing the second throw. Unclip the latch lock of the needle holder and release the white tip. Sorry, 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 unmuted. Let's uh, move on. Next uh, slide. One of those routine warnings by parents. Rode and Michelle, please don't chase the dog in the house. 
and one of those inevitable outcomes, Rode falls and hits the side of her head on the coffee table. Ouch, she exclaims, not thinking much of the incident. Let's go have some soda, Michelle. Sitting on the couch in the family room, Michelle notices Rode's ear. Rode, there's blood on your ear. Rode calls her mom, who discovers to her horror that a chunk of skin is missing from the top of her daughter's ear. Michelle goes back to the coffee table and discovers the missing piece of skin. They place it in a container, add a small block of ice, and rush off to the emergency department of the hospital. Dr. Wright has been on call for the past 12 hours and is getting ready to leave following a fairly quiet shift for a change. Please, doctor, the nurse requests. We have a young lady with part of her ear missing. Time is of the essence, and Dr. Wright prepares to do a full thickness skin graft using the severed piece of skin as the graft. Don't look so worried. We'll fix this like new, he reassures the patient and mother, and starts with the procedure. Local anesthetic, cleaning, suturing, and dressing. Will the injection hurt? How many stitches will I get? Dr. Wright talks them through the procedure. The job is neatly done, almost reflexively, and then the patient and mother receive instructions. Please don't wash your hair or allow water on the wound for 48 hours. Use this ointment liberally on the wound twice daily and please return in a week for the removal of the stitches. Don't hesitate to call me if you have any problems whatsoever. And off go the patched up patient and relieved mother. Would you like to be able to masterfully care for wounds? Okay, lovely. Isn't that a nice result? That is a full thickness uh, skin graft. And of course, you know, there are limits to full thickness grafts. Uh, you cannot chop off a finger and just uh, reattach it with suturing. But uh, a few millimeters of uh, the tip of your finger, uh, uh, ear and extremity, it, it really works lovely. Um, these are all real cases. It wasn't made up. And as you probably saw in the previous case, you know, you couldn't really make up that one. That's uh, 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 all of these cases are real. Of course, we, you know, uh, enacted some of the parts, but okay, now we're going to do the suturing. Let's have a look at this video. It's times five. Okay, it should be a video. Okay, are you in the mood for doing some suturing? Here we go. Okay, that's just like to whet your appetite a bit. So let's move to the next page. And I think that's going to, uh, th this is just a nice acronym to remember. It's, it's a, a type of a checklist. It's not necessarily in that exact order. And that is lacerate, L for look at the wound and assess it, A for anesthetic considerations, C for cleaning the wound, E for equipment setup, R for repair of the wound, A for assessing results, anticipate complications, um, tetanus inoculation status, 
and then educate the patient regarding wound care. So lacerate, you know, medicine is a lot about your acronyms, and this is a lovely acronym to remember, because if you go through lacerate, you probably wouldn't uh, forget to do uh, uh, any key aspect of the surgery. Next. Um, I, I, I think uh, this is something you can you can look in the you, you can catch up in the uh, uh, course material. Um, so let's just quickly go through it. Tight sutures will assist in controlling bleeding. Don't use suturing as a primary source of or, or method of controlling bleeding. Uh, control bleeding with bleeding control methods like your diathermy. It's a, a large uh, uh, five millimeters or more arteries. Tie them off. You, so your regular suturing is not going to hold it forever. Uh, it, it, it reduces the chances of wound infection. It reduces pain. Uh, it will optimize the traumatized tissue to maintain its blood supply. And wound closure is divided into primary. That's traditionally the first 24 hours. Secondary closure, that's after 24 hours. Next. And we're just going to, this is a little basal cell carcinoma here on the uh, just on the lower eyelid or just on the, yeah. And uh, so you make your markings, surgical markings, next. And excision, bleeding removal, bleeding control, next. This is just a nice case study. And this is suturing a certain lines that you have to respect in the face. So, um, you know, you cannot just cut in any direction. You have to uh, go along, usually the crease lines. Um, and that is, of course, 90 degrees to the uh, contraction of the facial muscles. And you can see this is a friend of mine. And is, this is unfortunately uh, 15 years later. Uh, but you can really, really not see the scar at all. Okay, next page. Okay, let me just quickly see here. I think for time-wise, we're going to skip this, a basic course. In the next page. And case study four, let's quickly have a look at that. James is off to work. James is off to work. Smooch! He kisses his wife Leticia goodbye and another four kisses to his four children, James Jr., Jake, Susan, and baby Brad. See you guys tonight, he exclaims as he closes the door. James is a welder, and not any type of welder. He specializes in repairing gas cylinders, big or small, even the larger tanker types for transporting truckloads of various types of gas. Today is a high-intensity day. 30 gas cylinders to repair, then the pressure testing and final quality control checks. The protocol is clear. First empty the cylinders, then flush them with air, and finally fill the cylinder with nitrogen before starting with the welding. Two inspection checks before James does his job. Now some people work well under pressure, and James is one of those, but James's friend, Jerry, is not. A bit lazy on occasion, he decides to take some shortcuts. And yes, it seems to work out well at first. It is 3 p.m., only 10 cylinders to go, and then I can head home, James thinks as he starts repairing the fine metal crack on the bottom of the cylinder. Then it all happens in less than an instant, a massive explosion as the quarter-inch metal casing explodes due to a trickle of flammable gas remaining in this specific cylinder. James is seriously injured. The soft tissue and bones of his face are in pieces and there's blood everywhere. His co-workers do what they can to stop the bleeding until the paramedics arrive. The paramedics finally arrive, resuscitate him and evacuate him to the trauma unit. Miraculously, James' friend Jerry emerges physically uninjured because he took the liberty of stretching his 15 minute coffee break to 20 minutes. James is profusely bleeding from his scalp lacerations. The trauma doctor places a number of interrupted sutures, tying them tightly to control the bleeding. Next, it's off to the theater. 
The anesthetist works like a machine to keep James alive. He requests urgent blood tests, administers IV fluids, and a number of life-saving medications. The trauma surgeon secures the airway by doing a tracheotomy, and this is followed by a multidisciplinary repair involving neurosurgeons, an ophthalmic surgeon, a maxillofacial surgeon, and a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. The lower lip is in rags, but applying the basic principles of wound care, the plastic surgeon starts cleaning, removing all foreign material and dead tissue. He then plans a layered closure, and 45 minutes later, well, the lip is fixed and presentable. Would you like to know how to repair major soft tissue lacerations? Well, stick to the basic principles of surgery and practice, practice, practice. Okay, so th this is what you're going to need. You're going to need your skin pad. You're going to use your needle holder and you are going to use your one of one of one of the suture materials. I, I think uh, you know as far as um, I think let's uh, use the silk that is uh, the one in the blue package. Let me just see if I've got here. Okay, silk suture and uh, you will need your Add some tooth forceps, and you're going to need your scissors. So that's it. Um, and then just another next. Uh, there's a list. Next slide. And that is the needle tip, body swage. Swage is where the suture material goes into the needle, and then the suture thread. And you don't want to clip the needle holder on the swage because you're going to undo the connection between the needle, uh, the needle and the uh, suture thread. And you don't want to go too close to the tip because you're going to blunt the needle. So uh, on the right hand side, that's a correct way. At the uh, back part of or, or the, the, the middle section of the back third of the needle. So just two or three millimeters in front of the swage. That's where you want to clip it. Because you want to have some distance to go through the tissues. Don't close, don't go too, like right in the middle. It's just uh, two or three millimeters away from the swage. Okay, next. Now we're going to do interrupted sutures. And this is important. If you do the interrupted sutures, that will be lovely. Let's have a look. Okay, maybe Use a needle can, with suture material. Just pause for a moment. Um, let's just get everybody ready with um, uh, suture material. So, you know, it's peel open, so you peel it open and then you tear it open. Like over here, I'm just going to. Okay, and then you will see there's a a little carton uh, with the suture material on. This one didn't tear like exactly the way it should have. So you take it out and there should be a little lippy there. And you just open it up and you'll see the needle there. And you handle the needle with your needle holder. Okay. Don't handle it with your fingers. And if you've got gloves in your suture kit, Put on gloves. It's just to get the feel. You don't have to because we're not working on a real patient. But if you do have, uh, then put on gloves and you know how to put on gloves, okay? If you don't want to, it's not necessary because it's simulation training. And if you need to adjust, you adjust it with your forceps. Okay, so there we go. And it's not like you don't, don't take your fingers, you know, it's like you work with blood and body fluids. Okay, so you should be ready with your tooth forceps, needle holder, and the needle should, if you hold it like this, it should face you. So the needle should face you like this. 
Are you guys ready? If you're ready, then we are going to first look at the video and then you are actually going to do it. It's very difficult to follow the instructions of the uh, instructor. So we'll first have a look at the video. Now, key aspects, I'm going to just see if I can get myself back here on there. So key aspects, it's, it must go into the skin at, can you see there, 90 degrees. Okay, don't go shallow. Don't go shallow, 90 degrees. And that is so you end up with eversion. Eversion means you want a little ridge on top of the, where the laceration is, you want it to close in a little ridge, not flat, not a defect. Okay. Are you guys ready? Okay. Dr. Shelley, I think we can have a look at the video. Real attached, clipped to a needle holder and the prepared imitation skin. Take the tissue forceps in your left hand and the needle holder in your right hand. Ensure that the needle tip is facing downwards and towards you. Use the tissue forceps to lift up the skin on the far side of the incision. Let the needle penetrate the surface of the imitation skin on the far side, approximately three millimeters from the margin of the incision at an angle of 90 degrees to the surface of the skin. Let the needle penetrate both the epithelium and the dermis. Assist the emerging needle through the tissues with the needle holder or tissue forceps, and then deliver a reasonable section of suture thread. Reclip the needle holder with the needle tip facing downwards and towards you. Lift up the imitation skin on the near side of the laceration using the tissue forceps. Insert the needle in the depth of the tissue on the near side, exactly opposite the spot where the needle emerged previously. Try to mirror the course of the needle on the two sides. Deliver the needle completely out of the tissue, including most of the suture thread, but leave a section of thread free. Tie an instrument square knot and cut the loose ends. Leave a long enough piece of suture material beyond the knots to facilitate easy removal of the sutures at a later stage. Alternatively, the interrupted suture can be placed as follows. Let the needle penetrate the surface of the imitation skin on the far side, at an angle of 90 degrees to the surface. Let the needle penetrate both the epithelium and the dermis. Do not unclip the needle holder. Lift up the imitation skin on the near side of the incision with the tissue forceps. Insert the needle in the depth of the tissue on the near side, exactly opposite the spot where the needle emerged from the far side. The course of the needle on the near side should mirror the course of the needle on the far side. Deliver the needle completely out of the tissue, including most of the suture thread. Leave a section of thread free on the surface of the skin. Tie an instrument square knot and cut the loose ends. Leave a long enough piece of suture material beyond the knots to facilitate easy removal of the sutures at a later stage. Okay, guys, you are actually now going to do this. So let me just give you a couple of quick tips. Number one, remember the 90 degrees. It must go into the skin at 90 degrees. So you use your tissue forceps and you evert, you bend, you twist it open. On the near side, twist it open as it goes through. Number two, don't go too close to the wound margin. Can you see over there? you want about three to five millimeters away. So if you go too close, it's going to tear through. So three to five millimeters. And then uh, with silk, just tie it properly, make at least one square knot. 
or a surgeon's not the surgeon you take the first throw twice round the needle holder okay so you can also um, make these i'll put it on the chat room um, uh, near far near far near far so that's sort of like to remind you how to tie uh, as you go round the needle holder okay now remember when you tie sutures it's exactly like with the uh, shoelace it's not now different you know and you don't tie you do not tie with this thing okay when you tie let me just see if i can i can just sort of like i'm going to try to just show you one over here okay so can you can you guys see it over there just um uh, let me just see i think you can okay so evert three five millimeters near side evert come through and bring it through okay can you see i'm putting it down okay don't start tying with this it doesn't work that way it's like the shoelace okay and leave it about an inch or two and a half centimeters and near far near far near that is the surgeon's knot tie and then far near far silk tends to unravel a little bit so okay let's do another one okay use this to position it from the near side evert go through oh, far side sorry near side come through try to avoid the tip bring it through now bring it through with just about an inch left here if you leave a lot of you're going to cut everything off and you're just going to use the suture once for one suture near far near far near far near far and make the knot on healthy tissue the knot on healthy tissue so don't let the knot be on the laceration the knot must be on healthy tissue to the side okay now that's your turn needle holder needle clip it like this okay please uh, my apologies to left-handed people you 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 probably used to it just uh, with, with all the instructions, just um, replace left hand with non-dominant hand and right hand with dominant hand. Uh, with our new course material, we've changed it completely. And it's, it's a lot easier. And uh, so, uh, yes, my apologies, but I suppose you, you, you used to uh, this level of, if I may say, discrimination. Uh, or whatever the correct word is okay i'm going to give you guys um let's just make it five minutes so 14 on on my it's probably an hour earlier or hour later on your side um but 14 or 15 30 uh, i'm not sure what it's in new york it's probably 9 30 <laughs> okay so we so 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 there you go and uh the, the knot tying is a bit tricky you know when you work with human tissue it goes through blood you know what blood is it's actually sticky it's a, it, what at least it's somewhat sticky so your suture material goes through the sticky blood 
and your knot tying is it's actually a lot easier when you work in human tissue uh, you can try uh, uh, at the butchery you can buy some you know pieces of um, meat uh, if you haven't got too much objection uh, suturing on pork that makes a really pork belly or pork knuckles makes a good uh, type of thing to go to the next level uh, but you can take a chicken breast uh, with the skin of course um, uh, or, or just a fairly firm type of uh, meat section yeah we and, used uh, 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 pig trotters uh, last year when we did the in-person symposium yes, yes that that is actually the next level because uh, you know the I, I just find, you know, amongst the producers of this uh, suture pad, there's a lot of, you know, my suture pad is better than yours. And but at the end of the day, silicone, uh, Dr. Shelley, you will agree with me, uh, silicone, it looks uh, a bit like skin, but the gel like nature, it, it's really not skin like uh, no. at all. So, um, um, we, we've actually got a much better type of skin that we market in our deluxe kits um, and you can do flap surgery you know they don't try to do flap surgery with uh, silicone it, it won't work no definitely uh, I agree um, by the yeah. way uh, one of the participants is asking if you could show the knot tie one more time I think okay. the, the when you're tying the suture I think they're asking for you to show that yeah okay i'm going to try you now just again with my uh just tell me if i'm going to just divert this now to yeah. over there is that good enough perfect yes we can see you can see okay so evert 90 degrees go in near side evert and to come out with a little bit more length and you pull it out. Okay, so just about that's a bit too 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 little. I want to pull it through, and then so it's like your shoelace. Remember the shoelace now. So just pretend this is the shoelace. Parallel. Come from the near side. So let's just make a square knot. Near side far side near side clip listen for the click there we go okay remember this is the ruler this is your shoelace and your this thing is done you don't you don't use that you use it to okay so that is and then far near far Clip and there we go. That's a nice square knot. Okay, three to five millimeters and you cut. Now we're going to do a surgeon's knot. Evert 90 degrees, three to five millimeters go in, come out either the near side section bring it a bit more through and you hold it so while you're pulling it through because otherwise you're going to so hold it and this is a bit too much again now we're going to do a surgeon's knot okay parallel to the laceration near far near far near okay so you go around twice, tie it properly, far, near, far, click. And you see the suture knot is on the one or the other side. Doesn't really matter, but if you make a lot of these uh, interrupted sutures, make the knots all on the one side you know don't make it zigzag it, it's just like it doesn't look good and you know 
surgeons, we believe this is your signature of your operation. You don't want anybody else to say, oh, you know, this is ugly. You know, this must be nice, must look good. So there we go. Three to five millimeters, both sides, 90 degrees in, and we bring it through. Let's leave about an inch or even a little bit less. Okay, near, shall we do a surgeon's knot again? Near, far, near, far, near. Click. And there we go. Far, near, far. And you go in the opposite direction. That, that could have been a little, I could have taken a little bit bigger bites here. Nonetheless, it's still within limits of fine. Okay, I'm going to maybe just for, oh shucks, I put a knot, put a knot halfway in my, you know, there's no, nothing to do, cut it off, it's going to be a problem. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys the mattress suture, so far side, five millimeters go in, near side and bring it out bring it through oh it's a little bit short okay turn it around now the needle must show in the opposite direction three to five millimeters from this incision you go in and you come out on the opposite side and you bring it out. And again, horizontal, near, far, near, far, near. Far, near, far. And there's a horizontal mattress. Okay, that's the horizontal mattress. Okay, hope you guys could see anything there. You know, this is not the perfect solution, but this is the best uh, I can do uh, at this point in time, short of flying to Sofia and coming and giving it in person, the, the lecture. Mm -hmm. So, okay, is everybody more or less happy? Let's just see the chat room. I've been getting chats from med students to my personal cell phone and they're showing me pictures of how they're doing so they're very very happy with how everything's coming out are they, are they getting there they are getting there they they look really good so okay. good job everyone <laughs> who knows my personal number good job good job you know it's um <laughs> the producer of our uh, suture kits is somewhere in the background and he just asked if on the um on the chat room you uh, students can if there's any issue with the aroma or the smell of the odor of the uh, uh, suture pads because mm -hmm. we had a, a batch that had a bit of an odor has that been a problem to any of you guys um guys in the chat box just, just mention if there's any like bad smell from the suture kits yeah from the uh, from this from the pad from the suture simulation pad, the silicon pad. Any bad smell? No, it smells fine. <laughs> Let me just... Uh, oh, no. One person is asking, uh, <laughs> one person said it smells quite strong, a bit, yes. Um, one person asked, how tight do you pull the knot to the skin? So you want to actually, um, you want to have a secure knot. So you, you tie the knot properly, okay? Um, especially on the second throw of the knot, you know, because you don't want to completely, um, how can I say, uh, you, you want the blood supply to be fine, you know, so don't completely go overboard with your first throw, uh, but make sure that you get good approximation. Now, approximation just means the two edges goes nice and snugly against uh, 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 next to each other once you've got that then on your second throw you really tie it properly you know give it a good proper tie because 
otherwise it, it tends to unravel. Okay, and different suture materials, different. Uh, if you use your nylon, it really tends to unravel if you don't tie properly. Uh, your uh, chromic, that's usually used, that's resorbable. So while we're busy with this, you'd really just get two types of suture, resorbable and non-absorbable uh, and non-absorbable. Now, absorbable sutures you use in the depth as a rule and non-absorbable on the surface as a rule. Okay, so you do get ex exceptions and, uh, you know, because in like in vascular surgery, you're going to use your non-absorbables uh, uh, in when you do, uh, when you tie and when you anastomose, that's a nice term, when you anastomose an artery when you, Okay, so, but let's just keep it to basics. Absorbable, non-absorbable. Your chromic cat cut, that is a commonly used uh, absorbable suture in most of the world except Europe. Europe doesn't really like the chromic because of a previous mad cow scare in Europe. But there are a lot of synthetic. I, I think the, um, the college and the animal derived sutures with, uh, will ev eventually disappear completely. I don't think in the 20th uh, century, 21st century, we, we, uh, I think it's going to, to, to become, uh, to go into this use. Um, so you get your Vicryl, uh, that is Johnson & Johnson produced Vicryl and a lot of other suture companies, Vison uh, or equivalents, and those are synthetic absorbable sutures. Um, there's a whole uh, ebook that I can send you guys with the choice of needle, the choice of suture, what different types of suturing. Suture material goes in different sizes. So the more zeros to this, so it's like initially they had suture material and they called it one. And then they make, made a smaller one and then they called it zero. And then they made the smaller one and they call it uh, one zero, two zero, four zero. And with ophthalmic surgeons, it's 12 zero, 10 zero. So the more zeros, the thinner. And the less zeros, the thicker the suture. Okay. Okay, guys, I think we should be more or less on the uh, stage where you've done a couple of interrupted sutures. Let me just see. Yes, so uh, we have to rush. Let's move to the next slide. Horizontal matters. Okay, let's constant, uh, I mean, pay attention. Lift up the skin on the far side of the laceration with a tissue forceps and insert the needle some distance away from the wound edge. Now lift up the skin, the near side of the laceration, and mirror the course of the needle. Aiming for it to emerge at an equal distance from the laceration edge on the near side. Do not tie or cut the suture at this stage. Move somewhat to the right of this subsection of the stitch, staying parallel to the incision line. Place the second subsection of the horizontal mattress suture like the first part, but this time from the near side to the far side. Tie a single or double instrument square knot or a surgeon's knot, and cut both ends of the suture. Dr. Shelley, we have uh, until 5-2, is that correct? Okay. Yes, yeah, so sorry, I forgot I was muted. <laughs> three minutes. Do one horizontal mattress for me, okay.
and uh, I'll try to keep you entertained in the meantime. Um, so horizontal matter sutures, you, 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 they're exceptionally good with eversion. So if you see your wound margins doesn't uh, make a little ridge once you've placed your interrupted sutures, um, you use your horizontal or your vertical mattress. That's exceptionally well uh, suited for eversion. You also use it where you want maximum raw on raw surface. So why would you like maximum raw on raw surface? That is where you try and close off one bodily cavity or area from another body, bodily cavity. So in maxillofacial and oral surgery, we sometimes uh, get a communication between the maxillary sinus uh, or anthrum and the oral cavity. And then we use special flaps and we use horizontal and or vertical mattress sutures so we can get maximum raw on raw surface and it's just more healing, it's more predictable. So we're not worried about aesthetics in the mouth, you know, who's going to, you know, who, who walks around with their, you know, pulling a lip aside and say, you know, just look at this nice uh, laceration. So not like that, you really just want functional closure and that's where you use that. And so it's exceptionally good with that and you get all this, healing that will be predictable instead of just this, you know, that's just like all this mattress sutures, lovely technique. Okay, I hope you've uh, completed your mattress suture. Let me just uh, see. Yes, I think uh, let's, uh, if you're still busy, let's just move to the next slide. I think that's going to be, um, let's just see what it's going to be. Okay, I think, uh, Dr. Shelley, can we skip the vertical mattress? That's going to be homework. Let's go straight to the continuous. Continuous suture is a bit quicker. If you're in the ER and there's three, five, ten patients in a queue uh, and they all have got lacerations, you're going to use your continuous sutures, uh, especially if it's like scalp wounds. Uh, they're not necessarily the best aesthetic uh, uh, suture. Although they're not, uh, you know, if you don't use it on a curve, it's a linear suture, you can really have a very a nice suture, even in the face using continuous suture. Okay, let's have a look. The first suture is placed by following the same initial steps of placing an interrupted suture. Tie an instrument square knot, but instead of cutting both ends, only cut the short end. In other words, the end without the needle. Ask an assistant to hold part of the long end of the suture, pulling it with mild tension, so as to keep the wound edges together. We call that following up with the next suture loop to the right of the first suture. Ask the assistant to release the suture as you proceed with tightening the second suture loop. Place a further number of suture loops. When you anticipate that you are going to be placing the last stitch, ask your assistant to release the suture. Make a square knot using the suture loop of the penultimate stitch and the remaining free or needle end of the suture. Cut the three ends with a suture scissors, leaving sufficient length of suture to allow easy removal later on. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> you there can you use your 
chromic, is that better? Then yes. It's a good thing to give it a bit of, it's, you see it's very um, wavy, very zigzag. Give it a bit of a like pull like that. And then uh, let's just quickly see. You can actually do a um, continuous suture very much like on your own. You know, it's not necessary to have an assistant. It's really nice to have one. Okay, can you guys see there? Yes. Okay, so lift up, come through, near side, and come through, and there we go. Pull it through. I'm using my chromic here now. And uh, so near, far, near, far, near, or you can actually just use a square knot. Near, far, near. There we go. Far, near, far. There we go. And you make your knot. Okay, it's unfortunately very much uh, a yellowish color. I'm not sure if the contrast is good enough, but uh, well, let's just do it. And then you just go from far side to near side, far side to near side. So here we go, far side, click. Okay, far side to near side. So you can see it's quite possible to do it very much on your own. Just pull it through properly. Maybe I should have used the, and just pull it to this side, pull it to this side. Okay, far side, near side, oopsie. Uh, that's a bit deep. Okay, there we go. And so you do a couple far side, near side. And th th there's a bit of a trick on the on the last knot because Far side, near side, and now you use the the loop as your so near far near far near far. And you cut the three pieces over there. Okay, so there you can see. Um, maybe not, in retrospect, the perfect uh, suture material to use on Zoom. I think the silk shows up a lot better on the skin, but nonetheless, that's the continuous suture. So you are going to get um, a lot of opportunity later today or tomorrow or whenever you want to, to continue with the uh, continuous suture and whatever sutures you want to, to, to use. So um, if you're still busy, just uh, with one eye, keep your eye to the screen uh, or just to listen, keep your ears open at least. Let's move to the next slide. And this is just a rough estimate in the phase three to five days, I usually take out facial sutures on a young person on day four. Uh, I, I, I'll be very hesitant to give three days, but that's according to the source over here. I would say four to five days, scalps, seven to 10. Uh, lower part of the, below the knee, 10 to 14 days, and then it still tends to open up a bit. And uh, the soles of the hand and feet are they notorious? You know, that's just leave it for in for three weeks, uh, two to three weeks. Okay, next slide. Um, the students are very welcome to download the PowerPoint presentation. They do have an online link to the online course material as well. Remove sutures. I think we shall leave this as homework. Let's move to the next slide. 
complications of surgery. Okay, so complications, we really do not like complications. And the best we can do is to minimize. You're always going to risk complications. And, uh, in, in, you know, this is just a little bit of, you know, maybe you're interested in how things are going in other countries. In South Africa, uh, uh, a well-known pediatric surgeon, professor, uh, and he's an ethnotist. Uh, they had a complication on a child and the child died at the end of the day. And uh, a couple of weeks later, the ethnotist got death threats and he had to get protection from the police. And on the day that they stopped the protection, a car drove into the back of his car. He got out, inspected the damage, and he got shot six times, killed. Oh my God. Yes. Okay. So sorry for newcomers to the medical profession. <laughs> Let's just cancel that. I didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you have, just, we have to worry about getting sued. So. Yeah, no, all the time. It's, it's <laughs> the same thing here. But, you know, what's happening is um uh let's let's go to complications yes. let's, let's, let's go to something a bit more okay so stitch tear through don't take two small bites i mean like you get it three to five millimeters and if it's very friable tissue adjust your technique you know use mattress sutures it won't pull through as easily as a as a, a interrupted suture you can read through this woundy essence why would the wound open up i would say two of the most common reasons would be tying this the the two sides of the laceration under too much tension you know you cannot you cannot bend the rules of biology too much you can bend it a little bit but don't try and go overboard make flaps make relief incisions make uh, harvest uh, full thickness skin graft do not tie like your life depends on it and under serious tension pull the two sides of the suture of the laceration together it will not work it will open up a few days later number two infection if you anticipate infection uh you know um treat accordingly you know go aggressive with your aseptic preparation um consider secondary suturing intentional you know leave the wound to fester and to sort itself out and then you go back a couple of days later clean debride cut off all the septic glass uh, granulation tissue and then you suture and you won't be a couple of days and the parents and the patient would say, oh, you know, is it going to really to work? Yes, it's going to work. Okay, but there's 13 reasons. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Sutures removed too soon. Use steady strips on the face, you know. Uh, uh, take out the sutures after four days, but place steady strips over it to keep it, you know, it's still very, very um uh, friable you might say uh, so okay foreign object was left behind arterial bleed switches were placed in a malignant tumor you know cancer loss of cellular adhesion so if your sutures pull through and if the tissue looks funny send it off for histology okay next slide Next slide. How is it treated? Treated by prevention. Okay, you get that. Next slide. Okay, here's a nice example. This is a basal cell carcinoma. This is the joy of having a light skin in a country like South Africa. Basal cell carcinoma. Oh, ugly, woundy essence, tearing open. You see over there on the right hand side, not good, huh? Next slide. But, you know, what uh, nature can do and what, so there you can see. 
a lovely result at the end of the day, uh, even with wounded adhesions, you know, so don't just like go back and go overboard. The, the body has got mechanisms, wound contraction and so forth. Next slide. Defective scar. Okay, that's where you have to start off with wound eversion. Next, next slide. Hypertrophic scar. Next one. Oh, just, just pray that you never get these uh, keloids. You cut it out and it forms again. You know, it's really difficult, really difficult. You know what you do with this? Send it off to a colleague, to a plastic surgeon. You know, they, they're going to get the same problems, but at least it's in somebody else's hands. Okay, next one. Pass the bucket. Um, these little dots will disappear, but if you leave sutures in too long, it's going to stay, these little dots. Wood abscess. Next, next slide. Cross hatching. Okay, don't tie to. Somebody said, how tight should you tie? Don't go overboard. Then you get these things, and that's going to leave scars. Next slide. Okay. Please leave all the sharps in a sharp waste container and discard appropriately. Uh, Dr. Shelley, you can give more instructions regarding that. You haven't used, you didn't work on real patients, so it's sort of like, but still, you know, don't, don't, don't throw it in the regular uh, waste, mun yeah. municipal waste, uh, household waste. Next slide. And this is the uh, link you're going to do later today or tomorrow or in the rest of the week. Uh, Dr. Shelley, you will give them the link and you're going to receive this certificate. Yeah. It's 20 multiple choice questions, and you're going to send me a photograph of your masterpiece suturing. And if I like it enough, you're going to get the certificate. Thank you so much, everybody, for your attention. It was a bit challenging via Zoom, but you do still have your link, online link to the course material, all the videos, keep on practicing. That's skills, that's like it is. It's practice, practice, practice. We'll it's also send out this so PowerPoint. Much. Yeah, we'll send yeah. out this PowerPoint directly to the students so that they could see it, um, like in one of our drop boxes or something, uh, just in case someone has any issues. Uh, but thank you so much. This was super helpful. And I think everyone had a blast, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so guys, the link uh, for the suturing course assessment is in the chat. We are going to bounce over to the main uh, Zoom link now for day four. We have questions and answers. So Dr. Anton, if you would like to join for questions and answers, we would be happy to have you there. To it's just kind of a free for all for students to ask us whatever they want. <laughs> okay, that, that would be lovely. Um, yes, I think we're slightly pressed for time. So let's just keep it to this. Uh, you're welcome to share my contact details to the students. Uh, groups of students help each other, you know, that's the way you learn. Thank you so much again. This was fantastic. Thank you. Lovely. See you in All the right. general room. All right, guys. We'll see you guys in the general room and we'll also do a raffle at that time. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye.